Welcome everyone to the Campus Pride Spotlight Series. My name is Ayla Azim, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm an intern with Campus Pride. For those who don't know, Campus Pride is a leading national nonprofit that empowers student, that empowers student leaders and campus groups working to create equitable college environments for LGBTQ plus students. You can learn more at campuspride.org. Today I'll be interviewing Purdue University for the Campus Pride Spotlight Series. This series is all about what campuses offer today's LGBTQ plus students our diverse genders and sexuality spectrum. We will highlight colleges and universities that are providing LGBTQ plus inclusivity on their campuses and learn more about their programs and services. I want to introduce to you the representatives from Purdue University now. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for meeting with Campus Pride for the Spotlight Series. Welcome. Please introduce yourselves. Please share with us your names, your role on campus, and your pronouns. Sure. Thanks for having us. My name is Lowell Kane, and I serve as the director of the Purdue University LGBTQ Center. My pronouns are he, him, his, or they, them, theirs. And I also serve as the director of student engagement and belonging at Purdue. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelsey Chapman. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'm the program coordinator here at the LGBTQ Center. Hi, my name is Adam Pell. And I'm the assistant director at the LGBTQ Center. My pronouns are he, him, and his, or they, them, and theirs. Thank you all so much for introductions. <laughs> It's wonderful to have you all here today. You have a five out of five star rating on the Campus Pride Index at campusprideindex.org, and you've been ranked among the best of the best in terms of LGBTQ plus friendly colleges and universities. So congratulations. To start out, tell us what are some things that are on your campus for LGBTQ plus life, and specifically, what does your campus do for LGBTQ plus students that creates an inclusive space? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so we're honored to have these rankings, and so thank you very much for, for noting the um, rankings that we celebrate on our campus. Purdue University is actually among the leaders in the nation for LGBTQ inclusivity, and we have a very young LGBTQ center. We're actually just about to celebrate our 10th anniversary next year. And so in a very short amount of time, Purdue has made great leaps in creating a very inclusive climate for LGBTQ students. Um, classes on campus that uh, focus on LGBTQ history, culture, and identity, resources, uh, living environments and spaces that are welcoming and affirming, benefits and resources for students, faculty, and staff, a plethora of ways for students to get involved in campus life and activities. And of course, our center is a hub and a space for all people, students, staff, faculty, alumni, family, anybody in the community can utilize the LGBTQ center. I'll invite other input. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, part of my role as program coordinator is to make sure that students feel engaged during their time on campus. We meet with a lot of students, second year students that are just kind of making their home on campus and we help to cultivate them during their time here at Purdue, whether they're here three, four, five, or six years. Um, I also facilitate allyship trainings on campus. We've had over 3,000 students, staff, and faculty here on campus take our safe zone trainings. Um, and our trans inclusion trainings, which are our allyship trainings. Um, it's really been a community-wide, campus-wide effort to make sure that LGBTQ students succeed and feel welcome here at Purdue. I second that, and I think um, one of the things that makes us stand out on campus is we've got this really broad community of staff, faculty, and students who show up for us and show up at the center um, and celebrate with us. Um, I know we're getting ready to celebrate our 10th anniversary, and so I think that's going to be something we're really looking forward to really kicking off with the whole campus, um, especially coming back after a pandemic and hopefully being able to do more in-person programming. And one of the things that we've been working on as recently um, is more graduate student engagement. So we know um, that LGBTQ undergrads right, typically do at some point express wanting to go to grad school. Um, and we've got a pretty also active um, community of graduate students who want to get engaged and mentor, um, as well as just find community. And so we've got an awesome graduate assistant um, named Lauren, who really does a tremendous amount of organizing with the graduate students who are queer identified on campus. Um, she does like every week or so what we call a queer grad coffee hour. So grad students come and hang out for, and have coffee with each other and touch base. But it also gives um, undergraduate students an opportunity when there's graduate students in the space to really learn about graduate school in a kind of a like boots on the ground version, right? And understand more what the challenges are and what the, the like awesome parts of grad school are. So it's been 
that part has been particularly rewarding um, to cultivate right now. Wonderful answers. Um, so what example can you all share that signifies the importance of having a space on campus for an LGBTQ plus student? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think about our space and where we're located, we're centrally located on campus. Um, if you come to the LGBTQ Center, you're coming to a space that is in close proximity to our four other cultural centers, which is very important to know that we are one of five centers on campus. So we work in connection with and in partnership and collaboration and support with our Black Cultural Center, the Latino Cultural Center, the Native American Education and Cultural Center, and the Asian American Asian Resource and Cultural Center, all within a two minute walk from our space. We're also in a building that is within a stone's throw of our health center. We're in a space that is uh, sharing a building with financial aid, the Dean of Students Office. We're very near counseling and psychological support services. We are very uh, connected is what I like to think about, right? So when a student comes or any person comes to seek resources, support and help um, or any purpose that you might come to visit the LGBTQ Center, we can connect immediately with whatever resources a person may need. So we often think of our space as a resource and referral center, right? Um, so that we can um, tap into the various resources and the partners that we have across this institution to make certain that whoever is utilizing the LGBTQ Center has the opportunity to persist and thrive at Purdue University. Yeah, I, I would just add to that, I agree with what you said, and we consider it our mission to make sure that if we don't know the answer, we're gonna help them find it, yeah. right? We don't want anyone turned away from here thinking, well, I don't know where to go next. Um, if I don't know someone in a certain office, I'll make some calls, I'll shoot some cold emails and see who can help our students. We're really um, committed to making sure that they get the help that they need. Yeah, and we're the building that we're in, um, as Lola was sharing, has a lot of resources in it. And on the first floor, actually, is the admissions office. And so we see lots of tours of, of prospective students along with their parents come through. And um, a lot of times they'll come upstairs and visit um, just to check out the LGBTQ Center. Sometimes we have parents um, and their students who come and, and check it out, um, even just because they're near campus or they've heard about us and they're thinking about coming to Purdue. Um, and then you know, inevitably we see some of those students matriculate to campus and they say things that I think are really rewarding. Like, you know, I chose to come to Purdue in part because of the LGBTQ Center or because of the LGBTQ Center. And the other piece that we worked hard on was really trying to promote the LGBTQ Center on campus. And our marketing office did focus groups with LGBTQ students on campus to kind of figure out what, what tone um, and kind of the themes to include in our info brochure that we share. and repeatedly they kept telling us over and over the students say they feel like they matter when they're at the LGBTQ Center. And I think that is something that has really stuck with me. Um, and that's something we want students to feel, especially on a campus as large as Purdue, it's easy to get lost sometimes, right, with over 40,000 students. But we know that when they come here, they're going to feel like they matter. Um, and there's there are people who know them and know their names and keep track of them. That's a wonderful answer. Yeah, having a space on campus is really important. Definitely. Um, so may you please tell us more about your campus's LGBTQ plus inclusive policies and how do students on campus feel about such policies? Yeah, so um, when the center opened in July of 2012, um, we were really fortunate to open our doors um, as a larger effort of students, staff and faculty who had been advocating for inclusion on campus for years. And one of the things that they did far before they, they opened the LGBTQ center was establish a fully inclusive non-discrimination policy, which includes right gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. So that gave us a, a starting point um, when we opened our doors to advocate for, for even better policies. And so one of the big um, pieces that we've worked on and we've had good partnerships across campus and in the community is, is building um, trans inclusive health insurance plans for staff, faculty, and students. And so we got our student plan in place um, prior to 2016, but we did it in partnership with the, the undergraduate student government and the graduate student government, along with human resources. Um, and then about a year or so later, we, we were able to get the same policy in place for um, staff and faculty. And so that's 
has been important to be able to tell people we've got these resources, but students actually can access um, uh, trans-inclusive or trans-affirming healthcare on campus as well as off campus in our community. We've got several physicians off campus um, that aren't too far actually in terms of just being able to get off campus. Right. Um, and so that's been really important. And we've had several parents actually who are employed at Purdue who do have, who have children who are trans-identified um, who have also been really thankful that we've had these health insurance plans. Um, and so that's something we've, we've worked hard on and I'm particularly proud of because it really did take an entire campus um, to pull that together. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, the other piece that I would add on to Aiden's point there, which I think everything that he's shared is fantastic. You know, we've also been very successful with the campus partners that we have here. Um, you know, we were building on, as a center, a foundation that was laid by, as Aiden mentioned, students, staff, and faculty who have been advocating at Purdue since long before there was a center established. Um, and so we've seen success in other areas as well, like housing, um, right? Having inclusive housing at Purdue is very important. Um, and I think one of the most important things that we've been able to do as a center is also compile all of the information that a person might need to access into a convenient location. So that if you have questions, if you're considering Purdue as a school for you, or maybe as a place to work and live, you can go to the LGBTQ Center's website. And there is a comprehensive list of policies, resources, information about local community resources. Everything is on our website and it's very accessible and easy to find. And again, as Kelsey mentioned, if you still can't find it there, you can always contact a member of the LGBTQ Center staff, and we're happy to get those um, answers out to you. Mm -hmm. And I think building on that too, a lot of the staff on campus and faculty, but I think about like our staff partners and offices like the student ID card office yeah. um, have really taken to heart more inclusive policies. And so um, they, they've in many ways kind of taken the lead um, on making sure that you can have a preferred or chosen name on the front of your ID card if you're a staff, faculty, or student. So they know, right, like how you present on campus, right? They want you to be yourself as much as you can be on campus. And so um, that's been really nice to see. And policy can sound kind of dry, but we've been really fortunate that, that in almost every office that, that has to do with policy on campus, we know names. Um, of people who work there, we can reach out and ask for help or say, hey, we know this is an issue, um, can we help you fix it? And, and more times than not, it's fixed very quickly. Wonderful answer, very comprehensive. So in your personal opinions, why does your campus feel the need to provide spaces and resources for LGBTQ plus students? Good question. What's that this one? Why do they feel the need to provide those things? Well, I mean, so I think that campus college can be a very confusing time. Um, and when you're juggling like a, at a university like Purdue, it's very academically rigorous. You have a lot on your plate. Um, trying to process identity development can be, on top of that, kind of um, distracting and confusing. So I think that by providing a strong sense of community and a, and a sense of well-being for our LGBTQ students, it really helps helps them to succeed and to graduate from Purdue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I, we see um, a lot of staff and faculty coming to Safe Zone training, which is our three hour ally training. Um, even I mean, we've been offering that training for years. I mean, really, almost yes. since the center opened its doors, and we've not seen a decline in participation in that time. Um, all of our CAPS, our counseling and psychological services. Um, Team is trained in safe zone. It's a requirement for them to, when they're hired, to go through safe zone training. And so I think you see this commitment from across campus that they understand that there are so many challenges um, and exciting opportunities that also come along with being a student. And every staff member and faculty that we're engaged with is really committed to student success in that regard. And they want to see LGBTQ students, you know, be successful while they're here and graduate and have an awesome career in life. And so. I see that commitment. We actually just did a safe zone training this morning, and, and we had a lot of really good engagement and conversation about um, how to be supportive of students during their time here. And so that's been really, I think, very incredible over the time that we've been offering safe zone. Just hear that echoed over and over again. 
And I'll add, you know, I think that that commitment to success, right, student success, persistence and success is very present across our institution. We want students to thrive. We want students to have the best Purdue experience that they can. And so our center provides a multifaceted approach, right, to supporting students from even before they are admitted to Purdue University through their college experience to graduation. Our lavender graduation is a big ceremony that we love to celebrate. We're working on it right now. Um, we have opportunities for study abroad. We have opportunities for training people, right? We, we want to make sure that people have the best experience throughout their entire time, even past graduation into the alumni experience. And our, our institution understands, right, all of these components that we and Kelsey have mentioned. And I also think that there's an understanding that the incoming students now are also coming to the college campus with some level of expectation that these resources also exist for them. And so that we are a part of the institution that, that LGBTQ plus people exist, that we are meant to be at Purdue University and every campus, that we are meant to have space, that we are meant to have resources and programming, and, and that we are meant to have support. And so I also think that the, the commitment that we see here and the growth of this center is reflected um, through that understanding as well. Really, really good answer. That's definitely so true. Like, that's, that's amazing. And I love Lavender graduation. Yeah, we do too. So how do LGBTQ plus students get involved on your campus? And do you have any active out LGBTQ plus student leaders across campus? <laughs> a few. Just a few. <laughs> just a few active. Um, how do they get involved? There's so many ways to get involved. You know, typically students may discover us at any point during their career, to be totally honest with you. There's no one way that they first find out about LGBTQ um, activities, the center, student organizations, classes. Um, but one of the ways that a lot of people first get connected is at the beginning of the academic year, we typically hold an event that is called the Rainbow Callout. And it's an event that I love. Um, it is our sort of welcome back to campus or our return to campus call out fair. Um, it has resources from across the campus and community student organizations coming together to say, welcome back, let's network, let's provide resources for each other. And in the 10 years or so that the center has been open, we've seen that event grow from a single room with about 50 participants and about nine resource tables to now taking up two ballrooms, more than 100 resource tables that have to be shared by organizations and typically over 1,000 to 1,300 attendees over the course of two hours. And that event just keeps on growing exponentially year to year with so much intentionality that our campus partners across the institution, in, they buy rainbow swag to give away um, just for that one event. And so we know that we've been woven into the fabric of the institution at that point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is typically one of the biggest events that connects people in. We usually do it in, in September, early September, but it lets people know about student organizations, the center, and what to expect for the year ahead. We lay out sort of a roadmap um, of what to expect, certainly for the fall semester and ideally for, for much of the year. There are several active LGBTQ focused student organizations on campus that will work with us or collaborate with us. Uh, we also have really strong partnerships with orientation programs here at Purdue. Um, we've held multiple um, inclusivity programs and trainings for them um, for when incoming students attend orientation week. Um, they're always sharing pronouns, introducing themselves with pronouns. Um, so that's been a really great collaboration and a partnership to grow. Um, but yeah, I think that our visitation here at the center is only exponentially growing, which is a really great, wonderful thing to see. Yeah, and I think with orientation programs, um, folks, it's been a lot of fun to see and participate, right, with our like kickoff events, right? So it's called Boiler Gold Rush, and it's the week before classes start, and it's kind of a crash course in all things Purdue tradition. And the vast majority of the incoming class actually attends, and so they break them up into small groups. Um, 
and they all have a team leader who's a student at Purdue who's been here for at least a year. And a lot of the team leaders very organically bring up um, the LGBTQ center or like wear something rainbow to show their allyship. And so um, we'll see like LGBTQ students who are just part of this coming in, right, as part of EGR or Boiler Gold Rush, show up at the LGBTQ center, right, in the middle of that week and say, hey, my team leader told me about the center or they'll bring their entire group with them. And then we also get to do um, like a, this, a kind of introduction to the LGBTQ Center towards the end of that week. And the community um, just across the river in Lafayette um, has Outfest every year, at rough, like right at the end of Boiler Gold Rush, which is our Pride Festival, right, right downtown. And so students can actually, uh, just on that weekend, we actually go downtown and, and meet with um, the local like Pride Center and go to Outfest. We see a lot of our student leaders show up the week of Boiler Gold Rush to start networking with students and start recruiting them into different student organizations. Um, and then we also do, uh, the first week of classes, an ice cream social outside because it's really hot and everybody loves ice cream. <laughs> and so um, we'll see people outside and, you know, they'll come get ice cream and go upstairs and visit the center. And so we always have try to have as many student leaders present um, that week too, just to help make people feel welcome on campus. Um, we've got I don't know how many student organizations um, that are LGBTQ. Yes. Six. Yeah. So there's there's different student organizations that are LGBTQ specific, but do different activities and different focuses. So um, if there's like a passion project or something students are interested in, they get here. There's probably a student organization that they'll they'll fit in very quickly. And I do think it's important to note, right? Even though there may only we may we may say that there's about six active LGBTQ plus focused organizations at Purdue. Purdue has more than a thousand student organizations that are active on any given year. So as Aiden said, right, whatever your interest may be, <laughs> there is probably a student organization for your interest at Purdue University, or you can quickly start one um, because you're probably not the only person here with that interest. Yeah. Um, and if you want, you can probably make it your interest plus LGBTQ, because <laughs> you're probably not the only LGBTQ person with that interest as well. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. I love the rainbow call out and yeah. the outfest. That seems so cool. It, they're great events. So if an LGBTQ plus student has an issue of harassment inside or outside the classroom, how will it get remedied or handled? Good question. You want to okay. I can, I can yeah, start. Sure. So typically, um, if we have a student who's struggling, right, or has, has experienced harassment, um, if they're not directly connected with the center, they typically know a student who is, um, and that student will try to like usher them to the center, right, to get assistance, or they actually may end up down the hall in the Dean of Students office where there's a lot of um, professional staff that are actually just there to support students as well. And we have a good partnership with them, so they may go there first and then come to the center. Um, and so really the first question is like, you know, what are you okay? What's going on? What can we do to support you, first and foremost, right, like in this moment? Um, and then the second thing is really making sure students know what their rights are and know that they have agency to make those decisions, right? We're not going to do anything without their permission. Um, we're going to give them some options um, of different, you know, ways to address it. Sometimes we've gotten really creative because it can be intimidating, especially if it's a large classroom where the, you know, power dynamic is you are one of 300 students potentially, and you don't really know the faculty instructor. Um, we've gotten creative sometimes and just reached out to like a department, right, <laughs> of that faculty member if there's an issue in the classroom or directly to the faculty and just say, hey, you know, we were thinking about, you know, your department or your class, and um, we offer all kinds of panels and trainings, and we would really love to come and like train your department so that it doesn't help that student who's had the issue, because that can be really scary. Um, but we want to make sure like that that department is resourced. So that's first and foremost one way to handle it. Um, and then there are other ways that we can handle it. We've got a very good relationship with our Office of Institutional Equity, who's also helped us address issues, and I'm sure you can speak to that more as well. Sure. Yeah, as Aiden said, there's a range, right? And so from, from that point, it can range all the way to working with our Office of Institutional Equity, where there may be a need to file a formal complaint, right? Um, where that office has formal investigation processes and they can pursue that um, 
with investigators. So again, it's not us doing that work. Right? It's the Office of Institutional Equity, which is a compliance office at Purdue. But we do advocate with students along Absolutely. the way. So we help them understand the process and we'll sit with them in those meetings if that's the, the direction they want to go. Um, we'll definitely be there with them the entire way. Yeah. And I think that's a very important um, piece for students to know um, that no matter what they decide to do, they never have to do anything alone. Mm -hmm. They'll always have an advocate with them. We are, we probably all had that experience of going with a student, walking through a process with a student, um, all the way through, quite honestly, to the end of processes. So. Yeah, and we're very fortunate here. We haven't had too many issues um, where students have experienced um, harassment in the classroom. A lot of times the biggest struggle they have is really figuring out how to introduce themselves with their name and pronouns if that's not what's on their um, record, right? Their like academic record. And so we've certainly helped students draft those emails. But the other thing that we've done so that they don't even have to be the ones to initiate the contact with the professors is we've started training instructors on campus to be the ones to reach out proactively the week before classes or just say, hey, I'm really excited. You're going to be in my class. This is a little bit about me. If there's you know another name you go by or set of pronouns, um, if you include on the roster, just let me know. Super looking forward to seeing you next week. And that's really changed the like perception students have and the kind of reduce their anxiety about starting classes that first week. Absolutely. That's marvelous. That's so important. That's amazing. <laughs> so how's your campus supporting students across their diverse intersections of identity? Can you repeat the question? How is your campus supporting students across their diverse intersections of identity? Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so again, we are part of a larger division of diversity and inclusion, right? So we're not a standalone center. We don't operate in isolation. We do everything. I think when I think about our programs, our services, and the way that we operate, quite honestly, um, is in collaboration with uh, our whole division, which as I mentioned, we're one of five cultural centers on campus. Um, everything that we do is in partnership with a host of other campus resources so that we're supporting our students, faculty, staff, and community at the intersections that we all live at. Um, we are, I think, very intentional about the types of programs, the events that we put together, the speakers who are coming to campus to tell diverse stories, um, the types of resources that you find in our center um, so that it is not a monolithic representation of one community, one identity. And I think that's a very important way to approach this work. Yeah, I would just add to, to that is that um, whenever we do programs on campus, when we bring major speakers, um, it's always been a very intentional thing for us to cross collaborate uh, with folks and departments across campus. Um, I can't think of a single time where we would turn down the, oppor the opportunity to work with others across campus to bring in more experiences and opportunities. Yeah, and on a campus like Purdue that is a predominantly white institution, um, that's something that we have to be cognizant of, and that's, I think, definitely informs our programming. Um, it informs how we do our safe zone training, right? So we try as much as we can to talk about intersectional identities in safe zone training. We always tell people, right, your allyship has to extend beyond just thinking about someone's gender identity or sexual orientation. And we really want you to be an ally to the whole person. Um, and I think too, we've got, you know, you were talking about the cultural centers, um, all of which are thriving and working really hard on campus. And we've also got student services um, that focus on a variety of different like areas. So first generation college students, which I'm a first generation college student. So that's something that's important to me um, and kind of my own development. But we also have a really incredible um, disability resources center on campus and they've been working very hard the last few years to update their model so that students know that they can go there if they're having any kind of issue and so we sometimes end up being a portal right or kind of a, a, a step to getting in contact with the disability resource center a lot of times students may have depression and anxiety but because that's both common but not really talked about in terms of being a disability potentially, even though it is, it could be interfering with their ability to go to class, right? Um, they don't see it as, as a disability, right? Or they still have a lot of maybe like internalized stigma about disability. And so the Disability Resource Center has been incredible working with our students um, to help them both like 
kind of unpack what's going on, but know what their rights are and get the appropriate accommodations. And so for students, sometimes who have really severe depression, who are having trouble waking up in the morning, the Disability Resource Center has worked with them to get priority registration so they can, they can register for classes that are scheduled later in the day so they don't miss class as much. Um, and there's been a, additional pieces like that, but that's been something I, I think has been so important because we want students to have a better understanding of what disability includes, right? And there's so many invisible disabilities, right? Um, and also know that they have support and they're not alone um, in kind of whatever they may be going through. So those are a couple of the pieces. Um, but if you want to talk about an island trauma with that program, I'm just yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, that's probably a great example mm -hmm. of, of an intersectional program and also how the work from this collaboration also informed their campus partners of how to do their job yeah. in a more inclusive way. So Yeah, just to give some context. So mm -hmm. in the age of COVID, <laughs> our major program series is really taking a step back due to the safety concerns, right? Um, this is yeah. um, a, a screen grab of our program with Niall DeMarco and Shella Mann. Um, this was a major program that we did in March of this year. Uh, it was really successful and a wonderful night. Uh, we invited Niall and Cello to speak with us about their experiences as both members of the deaf community and the LGBTQ community. It was moderated by a, dis a critical disability studies faculty person here at Purdue, and we had a great collaboration with the ASL club here at Purdue. Um, and this is just one example of the collaborations that we were talking about. But not only did this talk inform the campus about the intersections between the deaf community and the LGBTQ community, but it also informed Purdue staff on how to be more cognizant of accessibility uh, when it comes to programming. Uh, we learned a lot about accessibility, transcription services, interpretation services, and so did our colleagues over with Purdue Convocations and the, some of the partners that we worked with to make this program happen. So, really at all levels of programming, we're looking for people to learn and take something away from our programs. And plus it was super fun. <laughs> Amazing answer. Um, social justice, equality, and equity are constant journeys of progress. What's on the agenda for your campus to improve within the next two to three years? Wow. <sighs> oh my goodness, to improve in the next two to three years. Um, well, one project that we're working on, talking about student leaders, yeah. um, there's a great student organization on campus called Purdue Think um, yeah. that reached out to us and they're kind of consultants and training, but they reached out to us to ask, you know, like, what resources do you need or is there a project that you've been wanting to work on but you haven't necessarily had the capacity to do? And so um, we were like, well, you know, it's actually been really great. We've had, a, we've gone from like 20 gender inclusive bathrooms on campus to like over 140. But campus is so big, we don't have a, a like really good map of all of them or like even like an app to find them. Um, you know, when you need a gender inclusive bathroom, when you need a bathroom period, right? Time is often of the essence. Um, so we want people to be able to find gender inclusive bathrooms even on the campus as large as this one. And so um, that student organization has been really incredible at helping us kind of map out not only the actual physical bathroom spaces, but where some of the gaps are in getting more bathrooms created. Um, but we've got gender inclusive bathrooms in most spaces um, and buildings on campus, which is, is nice to see. So I think continuing to expand out um, gender inclusive bathrooms, we have gender inclusive locker rooms in the co rec, you know, are, but there's not enough of them because they're actually in pretty high demand. Yes. So looking you know, into the future, like how we can better um, collaborate with our co-rec and nutritional staff and wellness staff to increase accessibility just in terms of facilities. Because we do have a lot of LPT students who get involved in intramural sports and go to the co-rec all the time. And I'll add, I, I always am thinking about the opportunities for study abroad and international experiences. That's a very big part of the Purdue experience here and a priority from our campus administration. And we have operated a wonderful study abroad program that has been on hiatus, of course, due to the pandemic. So I think that we have had the opportunity during this pause to revisit what that program might look like and also make it a little bit more accessible to folks, perhaps by building scholarship opportunities, um, working with alumni to help cultivate that program and make it more approachable. Um, of course, study abroad can be a pretty expensive endeavor for a lot of folks, and we know that 
Students within the LGBTQ community may be differentially impacted by financial issues. And so finding ways, <clears throat> excuse me, to make that experience more approachable um, to more students, I think would be fantastic for us. We really wanna see that program come back online and even bigger and better than before. Um, I think one more thing, and I'm gonna put you on the spot in a second about it. Um, <laughs> so every year we've seen increasing visitation to the LGBTQ Center. So prior to the pandemic, we were seeing on average of like about 40 students come through every day and spend time at the center. So part of it is always expanding our space um, and finding more space. Yeah. Um, but we see students come in and they study and they hang out and use our computer lab and um, they play games and socialize and drink a lot of coffee. We always have coffee on. Um, but so that's part of it, right? Is like, how do we continue to expand and have more visitors come to the center and be part of this community? And so we've also started expanding out to more community-based programming. Um, one of our big successful events is Fabulous Fridays, which is kind of a, like a decompress and de-stress day. Every Friday afternoon, we do some sort of like basic craft, like kindergarten level crafts. It's a lot of fun, but you don't need a lot of skills. Um, but it just kind of brings people together to do something that's so different than, than study, study, study. And it also gets them to connect with the center before the weekend. So if they need anything, we're, we're better positioned to help them. Um, but Kelsey's also been working on a really big initiative as well. So can I put you on the spot about game night? Definitely. I thought I knew where that was yeah. going. <laughs> I was like, are we going to talk about Leave game night? Mind. Yeah. Yeah. So in 2018, I started the game night initiative. And this was really to try to connect with students who I noticed were coming into the center, but maybe not engaging as much or in the same way as some of our Fabulous Friday participants. Um, I'm a huge gamer in my personal life, and so I started game nights, and we started playing D&D, &D, board games, video games, you name it, we were going to play it. Um, and it's really grown, and pr game night now has, um, it's a series of nights that we just keep the center open late, we come play games, and hang out, and it's got the highest rate of unique visitors to the center out of all of our programs, meaning students show up for game night, they may not show up for anything else, but we see them once a month for games. And so kind of trying to shift around and reach different demographics that may not otherwise engage with our center has been something that I'm really proud of the success of that of that program. And we've got some really like very creative students. So they developed like socially distant Dungeons and Dragons yep. um, for the pandemic. So they can keep playing. So it's been really cool to see too. It's been fun. Really cool answer. That is so cool. <laughs> Um, so may I ask you a random question? So what is the queerest or most LGBTQ plus aspect or thing about your campus? <laughs> what is the queerest thing yeah. about our campus? Oh, man. Um, I'm trying to think. No. Yeah, I was going to say, like, one of us at I, the center? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, certainly the center is the, it's a hub. You know, we, we're in somewhat, sub, I would call this suburban or rural suburban Indiana. Um, so, I mean, it's not like there's a lot of LGBTQ nightlife around in the area. You know, we do have a pride center that is downtown that is separate from the LGBTQ center on campus. We do have, as Aiden mentioned, Outfest, which is a local pride festival that happens. Um, but the, the queerest thing on campus. I would say, I would say GRL's amateur drag show. Ooh, so there's good. a really active um, affirming and LGBTQ inclusive sorority here on campus called Gamma Rho Lambda, and they host a yearly amateur drag show, which is coming up. They're doing a virtual COVID safe drag show because the show must go on. Um, that might be the queerest thing on yeah. campus. I a, look forward to it every year. It's a fundraiser for the uh, Indiana Youth Group, uh, which serves um, youth uh, who are LGBTQ identified. Um, it's located in Indianapolis, but not far from here, but it, they have a lot of virtual events and programs. Mm -hmm. uh, we also love the rainbow. We've yeah. rainbowed a lot of things, um, and we bought our Purdue team store started selling rainbow merchandise, um, part of which the Part of the proceeds go to support our like emergency fund for students um so that's good and i also think the center i was thinking about you know it, it seems kind of obvious but but there is one thing about the center that i don't know if the university was expecting so we finally got around to painting the center and the university gave us this sherwin williams paint splash book i think assuming we would pick one color um, <laughs> for the whole center which was funny 
And so we picked one color for every room, which we felt was a pretty conservative choice. Yes. We may have painted every wall a different color otherwise, but um, they were like, oh, that's a lot of colors. Yeah. So we may be the at least most colorful like walls and space on campus for sure. I'll, I'll add two more tiny things or little ideas. Um, within the LGBTQ Center, um, we have a really beautiful collection of art and artifacts from sort of the history of the LGBTQ community. Um, and so I think that that's a really cool display. Um, posters, paintings, historic pins and buttons, um, flags, right? Um, posters from speakers that have come to this campus, um, historic marches on Washington. So I think it's just really interesting to see a history that we are always working to uncover and recover because it's often omitted from the curriculum. And so for many students, this may be the first time that they're seeing their history or touching their history. And building off of that idea, we also have this incredible partnership with the Purdue University Archives. And our archivists have been working with the LGBTQ Center literally since the week we opened to archive the history of the LGBTQ Center, everything that we have ever done on campus, and working with us to, again, uncover and recover the LGBTQ history of Purdue University. So pushing back the history of student organizations going back 50 years to Gay Liberation Front in 1971 and 73 at Purdue, um, and finding those stories with us so that we can better tell the presence and the activism and the push for change that has led to a space like this center even being possible. Amazing answer. I love that so much. I love art and like LGBTQ plus history is so important. Like that's amazing. Yeah. So to end our spotlight, how would you all describe your campus for a prospective LGBTQ plus student in three words? <laughs> We want you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please do. Please consider Purdue. Um, if you enjoyed our spotlight, if you want to get to know us better, we're happy to talk after this. Uh, just reach out to us. Consider Purdue. It's a great opportunity. It's a great experience. Uh, and we're here to support you during your time here. Absolutely. We're a big community. Um, we want everybody to know that they are welcome here. Um, and they're part of the Purdue community long after they graduate. Yes, we want you. We want you. That's yeah. Yep. I love that. <laughs> Please share for those watching on your website to learn more about LGBTQ plus life on your campus. Again, thank you all so much. Campus Pride appreciates your hard work and continued efforts to create an inclusive space for LGBTQ plus students to learn, live, grow, and especially thrive at Purdue University. It makes a positive difference in so many lives. Thank you so much, truly. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thanks so much. Thank you for watching the Campus Pride Spotlight series. If you wish to learn more about this campus or any other college or university, you can search for free at the Campus Pride Index online at campusprideindex.org. That's campusprideindex.org for over 400 plus colleges and universities who have come out as LGBTQ plus friendly. Again, my name is Isla and thank you so much for watching.